everybody. This is Marty Terry, and I have a marvelous, marvelous guest tonight for On the Other Hand. As you know, I enjoy having people come and having you get an opportunity to see them not in their role as a legislator or a CEO or anything like that, but getting to know the person. And I am really, 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 that's three reallys in case you missed, okay, thrilled tonight that I have uh, Themis Claritus. Said Very that right, good. right for an Irishman. That was not bad, right? Not bad okay. at all. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, I did my homework today. My goodness. I don't know. I spent the morning going, oh my goodness. Okay. Let me just tell you about Themis. Okay. You ready? Sit down. You can take a nap. Okay. Themis is the Republican Minority Leader in the Connecticut House of Representatives. Do you understand that? Connecticut Minority Leader in the House of Representatives? Thought you'd enjoy that. Voted into that position unanimously. Unanimously, I'll repeat it again, a female. Unanimously in 2014. And she is the first female leader in the House. And then when we were sitting here a little while ago talking, she had told me that her daughter, or no, I'm sorry, her sister has just been elected. Am I correct? Yes. So when we get past how wonderful you are, you can tell me a little about her. Um, but that's not all. She's a member of the Connecticut Bar Association. Yes. The New Haven County Bar Association. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, the Association for Conflict Resolution. Where were you when I was trying to talk my husband into some of these things that he, I thought was great? He thought I needed my head examined. You were that. not around. I'm sure I should have called you. Did a you. Fine job. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think so. Okay, she's received several awards from Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Has worked for the Umbrella Center for Domestic Violence Services. Uh, in 2016, she was named second. I told you, sit down, because we're going to have a few minutes here. Okay, she was named second vice chairman of the Griffin Hospital Board of Directors, is a member of the Walter Camp Football Foundation. Football Foundation, did you get that, everybody? Okay. And has received awards from the Connecticut Coalition of Boys and Girls Clubs. I love the Boys and Girls Club. When I was in Waterbury, I served on their executive board. They're one of my favorite organizations. I, while reading her bio, I was struck by the fact that she grew up around a family supermarket business that she says taught her the value of hard work and the rewards of community um, involvement. And you can see by what I just told you about her, she really takes that seriously. Um, she was elected to the House of Representatives in 1998. When I okay. was 10. When she was 10. I love that. She stole my line. <laughs> oh, no. Why did, nothing like having a guest who steals your lines, okay? And uh, serving the towns of Derby, Orange, and Woodbridge. Mm -hmm. And she's been elected every term ever since, okay? As the House Minority Leader, and this has got to be a challenge, because listen to this. As a House Minority Leader, she's become a leading advocate for fiscal restraint. Did you hear that? Fiscal restraint. Do you know anybody else that pays attention in this state government to fiscal restraint? But she does. Regulatory reform, job creation, and tax relief. That should make all of you sitting out there saying, this is somebody I really want to know. Okay. Now, after reading all of this today and going through it, I asked her associate, Jen, um, if I'd have to drop to one knee and kiss her ring when she came through the door. And she assured me I didn't have to, which is good because at my age, if I got down, I'd never be able to get back up again. So welcome, Themis. Thank I am you. so delighted you are here tonight, you know. This is, I, I, how many females are there in the state legislature, do you know? Uh, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but what I do know is I'm the only female leader, Republican or Democrat, in the legislature, and the House Republicans have the highest percentage of women legislators of any caucus, Republican or Democrat, which I'm very proud of. Wow, I like that. I really, really like that, because I think that's 
uh, the reason I'm saying that is not because I'm an old broad, which I am, but because you know what? That tells the young people, the women in the state of Connecticut, okay, we're outnumbered, but you can do it. I've done it, you know? But it also tells them that, you know, a lot of this nonsense you hear all the time that the Republican Party is anti-women, anti-minority, anti-fill-in-the-blank is not true. You know, it's just not true. I like that. I like that. Do you get an opportunity to speak in schools and things? Because I think that's kind of, I, I get so much negative stuff, you know, when you pick up the paper and you see this and that. And then to have uh, someone like you, a leader, go out and tell young people mm -hmm. that they can succeed I think it's just a wonderful thing. Just a no, wonderful I do. Thing. I get to speak. I, I take every opportunity to speak in schools because I do. I think it's important that whether it's young women or young men to see, to see who's out there and see who is involved and see what they can do because we know that it's not just about what w young girls think of themselves. It's about what young how young boys look at women. That's true, right? So it's, it's just as much about raising your daughters and granddaughters in a certain way. It's just as important in raising your sons yeah. and your grandsons because, because this world is the way it is bec and there's sexism, not because women are being sex sex sexist to each other, but because men are being sexist. Oh yeah. And that's improving every day. Every but day. But it's about raising your kids in the right way and having them both understand you know, that anybody can do anything they want, just about who's the most qualified, who works the hardest, and who's the best person for the job. Do that again. Who's the most qualified, who works the hardest, and what did you say? Who's the best person for the job. And who's the best person for the job. Those are, you know what, that's what they ought to have as a slogan for kids somewhere. Just because it, it sums it all up. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be what you want to be in this world if you apply yourself and you go from there. But And you know, I always talk about how my sister and I were raised you know, in a family where I mean, in a, in a big, small business family, but in a family where we were taught that you could do anything you want to do. And I mean, whether you want to run a corporation or you, whether you want to stay home and take care of your kids, whatever you choose to do is what you should, you should be doing. But, and I realized a couple of years ago, I always gave, you know, I said my mom is the strongest woman I know and she raised us that way, but I realized that it was just important that my dad raised us that way too. Absolutely. Right, because my perspective on men was always very healthy growing up because I had a father who was as supportive as he would have been if he had sons yes. of his two daughters. Um, and so I, that's why I just think the, the male influences in your life, whether they be your father or your brothers, um, whatever male influences in your life are just as important as the female. They gotta be positive. They got to be positive. I like that, I like that a lot. But, you know, when I was reading all this stuff about you, and yes, I, I did, you know, my homework and all that, but the thing that I um, want to know is what made you, one, decide to become a lawyer? Let's start with that. What made you decide to do that? Well, you have to just know that growing up, I was very introverted. You so were, I was very you, shy. I was very, I mean, at home, I, I, I wasn't introverted, but anywhere out of the house, I was very shy and introverted. And I don't really know the moment that I decided I wanted to go to law school. I think it was probably in high school when um, our school got involved in the Connecticut Bar Association Young Lawyers uh, Mock Trial Competition, which is open to every, every high school in the state of Connecticut. So one of our teachers, and a teacher I had at the time, decided she wanted us to participate in that. And I think it was a, a current issues kind of class. So she had a, a local graduate of our high school that uh, was a lawyer, and he was kind of our coach. And she put together a team, and the first year we did that, so there was people that played the lawyers and the, and the witnesses and the judge. You know, it was That's just fun. really a role-playing yeah. thing. And so um, we came in, we made the quarter fi quarterfinals in our first year, which was amazing because we were competing against some schools that had courthouse courtrooms in their, ho in their school, oh, right? Wow, so, yeah. so the second year and third year we did it, we won the state championship. And so I think that that made me, you know, really started my interest in, in, um, and in sparked that. it in, in the law. So I think that's really where it started. I see now, that's a good background. You, and I like you saying, you were shy and introverted because we do have a lot of students that are just exactly that way. You know, they're not mm -hmm. the bubbly cheerleader, happy is, you know. And I want them to know 
that, look, you can do anything you want to do, so don't be hampered by mm -hmm. anything else, you know? Right. Okay, so then, okay, you've already decided you're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a good lawyer. You probably got a job. I'm not mentioning where you, you're, because I don't want to, you know, mm -hmm. draw attention to any businesses, so to speak. But then, what in heaven's name made you decide to run for the legislature? I know, I wonder that myself on a regular basis. <laughs> it's interesting. Okay. All right, you win. You win. That was, that's classic. I wonder myself. Go ahead. Many days. Yeah. Not just once in a while. Um, See, I told you she was delightful. She's so honest. Go ahead. Well, I, I think that by becoming interested in the law, you know, politics oftentimes crosses over. Yes. And so I just started becoming interested in politics. And I, you know, my, my family were, they were Republicans. So I joined my Republican town committee in my town. And then they were looking for people to run. And you know, when they, for these separate boards and commissions, they just yep. put people to yep. run. It, yep. You yep. don't really have to know anything. It's, right. it's a weird concept. We just need a body exactly, in there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I, they, they had put me up to run for the, for the board of finance in my town and I won and that's how I got to know different people in town but then I went to law school so I wasn't really around right. uh, as much as I needed to be so I got involved in, in our local state representative race a little bit right and, you know, so it was just a little bit at a time it wasn't kind of one big thing right uh, that made me interested so I just continued to be interested in politics but a friend of mine who was in the US Attorney's Office at one point said in 1997 you know, the woman that is the state representative in your district is not running again. She's running for something else. You should run for that district, for that seat. And I said, I don't even know what the seat is. I mean, I didn't know. I really wasn't one of those people that, that was, had this yeah. idea that I was going to be in politics and I, was, I didn't have a path. I just had an interest. I didn't think about it. I mean, in my mind, I was going to go work for a huge law firm and, yep. you know, put my be 100 a hours a week in yep. and yep. become a partner and do that kind of yep. thing. So we kind of started doing our research and I ended up running. And I won, and that's, and that's how it happened. I, that tickled me. It's completely yeah. accidental. You, the first completely time you accidental. ran. Completely accidental. First time you ran, you won. And I thought, oh, wow. And then every term now, you just you just blow them away. I was looking well, at the statistics, you know, and I think it's fantastic. I'm delighted this. To, you're, you're just a... Um, you're my hero today. Well, thank you. You know, but I think that's really, really great, you know. And like I said, you're a role model, which is why I want, I hope young people will look at this show. And like Joe, that's here as part of my team, mm -hmm. he's a young person who's interested, and I think it's just terrific. I'm so happy, you know. Um, so you got your hands full up at the legislature right now. How do you deal with the frustration? I try to do yoga. You do yoga. Except when they tell you, they always say those nice things in yoga, you know, that we're thankful for everything we have and how we love everybody. And I don't love everybody. <laughs> I just don't. I mean, sometimes no. I love people more than others, but, okay. you know, they always joke with me, all my yoga instructors, that when we get to the meditation part that I can't sit still and we can't. <laughs> You're my kind of gal. So, so, um, yeah. well, I, listen, I, there are days that I, 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 I'm so frustrated. I don't want to walk back in that building. And uh, yeah, obviously, I, I mean, I think that. anybody anybody who has any kind of job uh, that has any stress whatsoever right. of um, any kind. I mean, parents don't want to walk back in their house half the time with their kids, right? Because exactly. they're so frustrated. So I, I definitely have those moments. But you know, as long as I still have the passion that I have for it, I will. You'll I will keep, keep on going. I'll keep going. When yeah. I don't, then you shouldn't do it anymore. Right. Right. Oh, uh, I, I was so delighted when I when you said yes you would come on here because I thought we read your name in the paper mm -hmm. you know and and it's a name but when you get to see the person and you find they're warm and they got a sense of humor and uh, you can say anything to them and they don't get insulted you know and you didn't walk in here with it well, I rarely know. ever get insulted no. no and I think that's great I think it's wonderful but when in all your research, did you look find out what my name means? No. Venus what? is the Greek goddess of justice and law. It's the, the blindfolded goddess holding the scales. I love that. So I always say that my parents had foresight. You're, I guess they did have foresight. Isn't that something? The goddess of justice and law. Justice and law, and that's what your name means. 
See, aren't you glad you tuned in? You wouldn't have known that if we did. she didn't <laughs> tell us tonight. Isn't that great? I'm telling you. I think that is just wonderful. So, I hate to get into the political stuff, but I guess we're going to have to ask, I'm going to have to ask you some questions. Though I did promise you, you know, it wasn't a gotcha, and it isn't. Um, so, I put them down as points to ponder, okay? And one of the things that you are dealing with right now, or have just dealt with, um, is the budget. Now, it's going to be very, very frustrating for you, with your background as a lawyer, also having a family business, to um, deal with a, con a group of people up at the legislature that don't see things the same way you do. They think that we should spend money rather than be a little prudent or fiscally responsible. How do you hand how do you deal with that? Well, you know, the problem is is that even though once you're elected, we all have to work together and we all have to figure out what the best solution for the state is. And and that means whether there's an R after your name or a D after your name, we're right. all still charged with the same responsibilities. Yeah, exactly. But when you look at year after year after year. If you look in the past nine years, this state has put forth two of the highest tax increases in the state's history, the highest borrowing we've ever had. Every regulation and anti-business bill you can find have been put forth in the state of Connecticut. And did it put us in a better place? No. No, we have a $3 billion deficit. Okay, so I would be the first one to say, listen, I guess I was wrong all these years. Those tax increases have helped the state get, get back on, on solid on ground. Feet, yeah. But it hasn't. It just what you want it to be and the reality are two different things. And my frustration with my colleagues, who are not of the same mindset as we are, is that they are not dealing with the reality of it. They're not dealing with the reality. Now, I know you cannot cut enough only to right. make the state good. You can't, and you know what? You can't tax enough to make the state straight, but you have to figure out what you believe state government should be. Absolutely. And when you have such huge deficits and such limited resources, you have to figure out what your core reasons for state government are. I mean, and for me, they're public health, public safety, you know, education, elderly services, uh, you know, yeah. education and, and preschool and, and that and kind of thing. Are the core and making things. sure you're protecting people and the people that need our help should have our help, but that does doesn't mean everybody should. Exactly. You know, and so that's where the problem comes in. And we hear about state employee contracts. I mean, listen, I have family members that are state employees. It's not about people being bad or good. It's about what's sustainable. Right. And when you have a group of people that are also part of the entire population of the state of Connecticut, something's going to give. There's not enough money to go around. Yes. And so, you know, we have to look at this group, but we have to look at this group and that, that group. And remember that all those groups are part of the big group of the three and a half million people in the state of Connecticut. And it is not sustainable anymore. Right. It's just not. I mean, you have a budget this year. And we've heard, you know, I, I, if I never hear the word tolls again, it will not be too soon. And you I know. stole my next I'm thing. I'm sorry. No, I can't no, help go. It. no, go um, with it. Go with it. Because you know, that's right. I talk here. about it every day, all day long. And people want to talk about it and they want to ask you about it. We should be in a situation now where we can have a conversation about about tolls and borrowing and all of these things in a big picture. Yes. We, we should be able to, but we're not for one reason. People in this state do not trust the government of the state of Connecticut. You, you summed okay? it up. You End of story. So up. here's the problem. You've seen toll proposals of 88 toll grant gantries, 80 toll gantries, 55, 50, 20, 30, 12, 10, 1. I, there's been every week, it's like the roulette wheel, right? Yes, it or is. Wherever it stops, yep. that's where they decide that that's going to be the, the proposal this week. You've yep. seen every different combination of how much you're going to pay per mile in Connecticut, how much you're going to pay per mile if you're out of Connecticut. Are we going to have a special card if you live here, if you don't? There has been every different proposal, and the reason is, there's not enough support for any of them. No, there isn't. But You're what people right. need to understand is all of those toll proposals have one single thing in common, $1 billion. That's it. The state of Connecticut wants $1 billion out of your pocket. So yeah. whether it comes from 88 tolls or one toll, they want the it. $1 billion remains the same. 
So you heard probably yesterday the governor come out with his new revamped transportation plan that is just as vague as every other transportation yeah, plan. Yeah, I got nothing and out his, of it when I read it. Because, I and you shouldn't have because there was nothing. It was this whole notion of, well, maybe there'll be some tolls and maybe we'll borrow some money and maybe we'll, then we're trying yeah. to go to Washington to see if there are federal dollars. Well, yeah. here's my answer to that. Those are all diversionary tactics. It's yes, trying to take sure. your eye off the ball. Yep, absolutely. Number one, because people don't under, need to be very clear that it doesn't matter how many toll entries there are. There's yep. still $1 billion. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so they're trying to divert your attention. The other issue is if there's federal money that we haven't been availing ourselves of, yeah, what have our two not? U.S. senators and five U.S. congressmen done yeah. well, all yeah, these years? Exactly. Where are so they? we're supposed to do that, too? Yeah. What have they been doing all this time? I so that's a failure on our federal delegation yep. from, from morning till night. And I, I want to know where, where they've been. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So they're, they're trying, so they're trying to tell you yesterday, I mean, if you listen to it, we're trying to get federal dollars and we're trying to do, they're trying to do that, we but you still done. want you to pay for tolls. Right. And my problem is this, the people of the state of Connecticut don't trust anybody because they've been telling you all this time, there's no way we can, we can fund transportation, right? Unless yep. we put tolls in. Do you know that in the budget that passed in June, they took $171 million out of special transportation fund? So they ra pulled that out, they rated it, and they stuck it somewhere else to fit, fit some other hole. So that they Don't tell me you need, need money, money when you... You're, you're robbing Peter to yep. pay Paul. Yep. Or robbing Peter and playing with Paul because oh. you don't really know where that money is going. And all the, well, the bottom line, and, and $1.7 billion of tax increases. Yes. And you know I what the that. common denominator there is? You're robbing the state of Connecticut. And, and the That's thing who you're is, robbing. as I read the new taxes that they've so, you know, that they've passed, okay. They're nickel and diming. Mm -hmm. We, the taxpayers, are dying with a thousand small cuts. It's 1% here, and we're going we're gonna to tax, uh, um, oh, I'm just off the top of my head. We're, go we're going to tax, um, what the heck was I reading? 1% on meals in restaurants, and uh, beverages are going to be taxed, and um, and but how about if you go in to stop yeah. and shop and you get a chicken? Yeah. But if you eat it there, yeah, there is or isn't a tax. And if you take it home and eat it, there you is or pay isn't the a tax. tax. I, I, I couldn't. You know, my mom it. likes to watch that show, Judge Judy. Oh, yeah. yeah. And she always says, "Don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining." <laughs> That's what they're trying to do to you. <laughs> That's what they're, I that's love what they're your trying mother. to do. I love your that's mother. what they're trying to that's do exactly. with and, this plan. And you know what? We are very jaded because they promised us the lottery money was going to go to education. Remember? Well, you're too young. But that's my. I remember my husband saying to me, "Forget it, honey. It's not going to go there. Once it goes into that black hole of the general fund, it's going to become." candy money for them mm -hmm. and they're going to spend it anywhere they want and it's not going to go towards education and he was right i mean and that's the problem with tolls you know i mean people we know a, yes. a common sense person including me will say well i could be open to supporting for example a toll on the on the you know the charter oak bridge right if it needs to be replaced. So that means it stays there for the amount of time it needs to we can fund the bridge and right then, then we have then to pay goes. off the, here's the problem so however long it would take to fund it. I asked the DOT commissioner, well, when do you consider it fully funded, like finished? He goes, well, it's got to be funded, and then when all the notes are paid off. Now, that's not one year, I okay? Because when the no. notes are paid off. Yeah, when the notes so are paid So that's a off. long time, A, and by the time those notes are paid off, the bridge is going to need to be replaced soon thereafter. Exactly. Which means that toll's never coming off. So then okay. I said to him, once it is paid off, hypothetically, can we t take the toll off? He goes, no. But we can use it to fund other things, other transportation things, you know, in the corridor or in the area yeah. or whatever. More but smoke. again, same yeah. thing. It yeah. never goes because those projects don't take a month. No. Nope. You know, and nope. it doesn't take a year to pay off the notes exactly. and, you know, so on and so on. It's like the income tax, right? It is. That exactly. was never going to go away. Once, once there is a spigot of revenue into the state, they cannot help but spend it. Right. And the conveyance tax. What, mm -hmm. Roland said that was supposed to be, what, nine months, six months, Sunset something like that, and it's still rolling right mm -hmm. along, and um, I don't remember. In the hospital tax, I mean, ask the poor hospitals. Yeah. You know, ask the poor hospitals in the state. Governor Malloy looked them straight in the face, all the CEOs and the hospital association. Listen, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to add a tax 
to what you all pay. Then I'm going to take that money, bring it to Washington. They're going to do their magic, and then they're going to bring back. We're going to bring back more money than you paid. So it's going to be a net gain, right to right to their faces. Now I sit on a hospital board, so I get it. And they have never done taken that tax away. And the governor has had a governor Malloy at the time had a huge problem with the hospitals, and nobody could ever figure out why. And so we were hoping that okay, well he's gone. Governor Lamont will be right. much better. Right. And he still hasn't done anything to fix and they're still negotiating a different deal. We're supposed to come back at the end of September in special session to to that agreement, but right now they haven't agreed to anything yet because you know, I mean in plain yeah. English they're trying they're just trying to, to hit him as much as they can. I mean the former OPM secretary, the budget director for D Governor Malloy was asked on the record in a committee meeting, "Why do you keep going after hospitals?" Right. "Why do you keep taking money from hospitals?" And he said on the record, he goes, listen, it's like robbing a bank. That's where the money is. Whoa. He said, I mean, first of all, it's, like robbing it's bad a bank enough if you think it. Yeah, yeah. You know, but you don't put say it, it in words. On, in a committee meeting on TV. And especially yeah, so a hospital. That's what we're dealing with. Because it's so, I mean, our hospitals are so vital mm -hmm. to the economy, to the people's welfare, health, and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to tax them or we're going to do, we're going to try and make money off of them. That's crazy, crazy stuff, I'm telling you. Okay, you did very good with the, your, okay, now I read, did my homework, okay? All right, and you have taken on something that I learned from you, and I'm an old dog, so don't, don't tell me you can't teach an old dog new tricks, because she did. You brought something out in one of your articles that I read, about quasi-public agencies. So, Murdy said, what's a quasi-public agency? So I went out and I looked, and I went, uh, a Connecticut lottery? Mm -hmm. Notice, Connecticut Lottery Corporation. Well, that's the public part. That's right, Connecticut Port Authority, Connecticut Student Loan Association, Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. I just picked out some that right. people would would relate Recognize, to and right. would know, right? And um, now I found it interesting, and maybe you can explain this to me because I can't balance my checkbook, so you need to talk money to me, okay? I found it interesting that the lottery boasts that it took in $1.2 billion and gave the general fund $345 million, okay? Now, where did the other roughly ninety million dollars go? Well, there's you know, ju just me. just like with the casinos, there's deals that are made as to what percentage goes to what. So, so some of that money, I can't tell you every every dime no, of where it goes, but that's right. But there's a percentage that's been worked out with all these organizations. The bigger problem right now with those quasi-publics, and remember, the reason that those exist, yeah, is because a lot of these were actually government agencies to start that's what I and, but said. <laughs> but we all know that government doesn't work efficiently right so some of them were taken out years ago and made into quasi publics which means it's part private part public in a sense and um, because we thought that they would work better because when they are under the you know auspices of the office of policy and management and then I mean we can't even you know to, to walk from here to the door takes a day for, for you know government <laughs> and it takes us 10 seconds so we all know government does not work efficiently and does not move quickly so that's why some of those are moved out the biggest issue right now is the port authority yeah, yeah I read that in one of your now, articles now so former talk to speaker about Sharkey that. that was his big thing he wanted there to be a port authority so this is a new a relatively new development that we have a port authority now what is there's three a port there's three deep I mean you know like there's one in New York okay oh, but yeah. they have the port yeah. authority there's three deep water ports in Connecticut, New Haven, Bridgeport, and New London. And there's a lot of commerce that goes through them. And so we right. wanted to make sure that somebody was keeping an eye on them. So it was, it was a good idea. To but when start. it was put together, there weren't as many details as were necessary to put this together. So there's a board, and there's an executive director, and there's a, the chairman of it. And what you've seen in the past several months, and we as leaders all have appointments to this board as all of these we have appointments to all of these commissions and boards and agencies and so my appointment has certainly keeps me in the loop as to what's sure. going on for what's a year he's been on? very concerned about 
the missteps and the misdeeds that have been going on in that Port Authority. And then you, you've seen the past couple months, that's all become public. The executive director stepped down and the chairman stepped down and they, they approved $3,000 for pictures that the executive director's daughter took to hang in the walls. I couldn't, I couldn't believe okay, that. From an iPhone, yeah. by the way. Number two, they, they hired an interior designer. Now, I want to know why the Port Authority needs an interior designer to begin with. I'll go down there and do it for free. <laughs> but then they hired somebody from out of state to do it. To do it. That was, I think, three times more money than it would have been if you hired somebody local. So, I mean, these are just, I mean, this is low-hanging fruit, right? This isn't nitpicking a budget and saying you could have saved a little money here or there. These are big deals. You can't find their budget online anywhere. So the public part is out the door because right. the public can't see any of it. So we made it very clear that the man that was the chairman who stepped down two months ago, but still on the board, he shouldn't be on the board. No, he shouldn't. And he's the also board. the deputy, deputy secretary of the state, who's, if you look at his job description, talks about, you know, administering elections and ethics. And you're, you're allowing somebody to get $3,200 for eight iPhone pictures? I, 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 right? I mean, so there are just my mind. problems. So the auditors are in the middle of doing an audit, as they should be. Um, so that should, I'm looking forward to those results. Do you think you'll get the support from the rest of the legislature when you're bringing these things to their attention? Well, we had a meeting yesterday with all the leaders and the governor about these quasi-public agencies and, Good. and what we're going to do about them. I mean, part of the problem is, what's the answer? Do you bring them, do you bring them back, back into, under, the under the state to a certain extent? Now, I think it's possible that just the money part of it, right, the budgetary parts, right. should all go back under, under state government. So the you can of see where the management. money is I going. Mean, we need to see where that money is going. I mean, it's still quasi-public. So we're the public part. Yes, you so are. So we should have to see where that money is going and understand and, and either say yay or nay on it. I mean, they're, they're kind of running very cowboyish on yeah, here. And that's it, how this stuff happens. It should never happen. And, and, I, and, those, and let's remember, the Port Authority, in addition to those three deep water ports, We've now, in a very bipartisan way, this, uh, this session, voted on a big wind project down there in that part of the state, in New London. Um, and that's going to be a big source of energy for the state of Connecticut, which is what, which is what we need because of the high energy prices. Right. And they're going to be administering that. They're going to be overseeing that. So that's one of our bigger commerce projects in the state in many years, particularly for that part of the state, which really needs it. Okay. which really needs development and business, and that's a huge boom for them. And the fact that this Port Authority is like the bad news bears at this point, oh, yeah, and not able to like get out of their own way, yep. is a big problem. It needs to be straightened out yesterday, not, not, not in not government in, time by next say, year. Yeah, by ne uh, that's what I was just going to say. Not a year from now, we got to deal with it now. And you're absolutely right. right. The, uh, when the, the legislature okayed the fact that um, we were sold Eversource and... Uh, I'm I'm a little very um, skeptical about that whole thing because um, I worked for Northeast Utilities for 25 years and we were self-contained. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did everything. We did the generating, <clears throat> we had the plants, we did the distributing, and we had people that were Connecticut community members that worked there. We did the public relations, we did the labor, we did all that. You know, we did everything, okay, and and employed and worked in the communities. And then Eversource came in. The prices went up. The amount of people that are Connecticut residents went down. So um, I'm a little bitter about that. So, mm -hmm. but that's not your fault. But I'm just bringing that little thing to to the forefront mm -hmm. here. I think they sold us down the river, and I I, I got a good living out of it. And they were wonderful people to me, so I carry that with me. I think you mm -hmm. know. So anyway, that's that's my complaint for. But today. I mean, listen, that's why you know this deal, this wind deal. That's why it's got to be monitored. That's right? exactly right. You need people right that there. you can trust to keep an eye on what's going on. You are one hundred percent right. That's for that's for sure. You know. Now, um, oh, I bet you're going to love this one. The new taxes. Okay. Where did some of these new taxes come from? I mean, is there are people you talking there about the sales tax exemptions? <clears throat> I don't know enough about that. Well, which one? Give me one. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> let's see. 
We already talked about the 1% tax on prepared meals and restaurants. Okay, so those right. are all sales. We, we but we have, so everything in the state that should be charged sales tax, yes. there's a, a list just as big that are exemptions from sales tax, things that for oh, years so you I don't have to pay. It. So okay. those now, the exemptions have been removed. So the governor and the Democrats will tell you Wait that a minute, back they'll, they'll back tell, back tell you we didn't we back didn't back put in a new up. tax. No, you <laughs> added and you got rid of an exemption. Okay. Oh, that see now when I did my homework today, I did not pick that up. But so, but here's the thing. It's still a new tax because you didn't still, you didn't pay it before never July first. You paid for it before. Right. So, so you know, they eliminated that, and then they added new taxes on to what we're already paying. They got rid of the exemptions. Yes. So there's now a tax where there was not before. Oh, are they sneaky or what? But it's like one of the, you know, they love to use those words because there's a particular Democrat senator a few months ago in a committee meeting talking about tolls when we were saying yeah. what I had said earlier. You guys have raided the special transportation fund all this time. You, you want to raid it again this year. And she said, we didn't raid the fund. We just diverted the money. <laughs> no, now I'm clear. I'm sorry. <laughs> How do you keep a straight face when somebody says... Oh, I don't. I never keep a straight face. I was going to say. That's the whole point. That, I mean, I just had to laugh out loud. So, Do you know you what a that? revenue intercept is? No. Tell me what a revenue well, intercept interestingly is. interestingly enough, I don't know if you've heard about this, this education foundation with the Dalio... Yes. Foundation. Oh, that's here in the back. Yeah, but sure. go ahead. I was going yeah. to ask you about that, but you go for it. So the Democrats in the legislature and the governor set up this called a Connecticut Partnership. Yeah. So Ray Dalio and his wife, who, if people that don't know, he's the most successful hedge fund person in the world. Right. And he's in Connecticut, and he's made a lot of money, and he is, they have decided to give back money, they, they want to put it into education. I think that's wonderful. They have I, a, the I Dalio agree. Foundation and they've gone into inner cities and helped kids with education and they've been doing that for many years. Yep. So they came to the governor and they said, we have an idea. Yep. Now, he knows the governor and the governor's chief of staff used to work for him, so they have a relationship. Yep. How about this? I'll give you $100 million yep. if you give me $100 million, meaning Dalios will put in $100 million. We have to give $100 the, yeah. million, and then I'll raise another $100 million. The governor goes, that's a great idea. Now, here's the problem. We don't have $100 million. <laughs> no, okay. We don't have $100 million cents. <laughs> do n literally do not yeah. have $100 million cents. No. So, we don't, so as great of an idea as it is, if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. That's right. So it's $20 million a year. So we put $20 million into this that we do not have. But... We were told originally it was going to come from last year's surplus, it was going to come from this, come from that. What it ended up coming from was what they call a revenue intercept. So just imagine in your home, there's mm -hmm. a box on your kitchen counter where the money you make from your job, the money your spouse makes from their job, you know, maybe stocks, investments, anything, that anything that's spendable. Right. Anything that you have that is spendable to pay your bills, to pay your mortgage, to pay everything, goes in that box. So let's imagine you decide you get your paycheck this week and you don't really want to put it in the box. So you go spend it on something else. Right. right? You've intercepted that money. So now it's not part of the pool of money that your family can spend. So in Connecticut two years ago, we did a bipartisan budget for the first time since I've been there. And it's because there was a tie in the Senate of Republicans and Democrats and a four vote difference in the House of Republicans and Democrats. Right. So for the first time, because, there's been, equal because there's been 45 years of Democrat control, control of the House and the Senate e exactly. in Connecticut. Yep. And so it took 11 months to get this budget done, but it was a bipartisan budget. And for decades, we've been pushing having a spending cap, having a borrowing cap, having all these caps, which you have to do in your home, right. or, or else they'll throw it. you out of your house. That's exactly right. Right? I mean, it's very simple. And take your car. Yeah. So we passed a spending cap and a borrowing cap first time in decades it's ever been done because they had to. So back to the little box in your kitchen. If your salary does not go in that box, it doesn't count anymore as part of the money your family can spend. So what they did was they took $20 million from somewhere, who knows where it came from, could have been lottery, could have been from casinos, it could have been from any revenue, and didn't put it in the box. You want to know why? Because we have a spending cap now. So if it and doesn't that, show and up. And right now if you look at the budget, 
you'll see it was only a couple hundred thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars or some small amount we were under the spending cap if you added that twenty million it but it would have been way, way over, over it. And so they, they sneaked around and they took the money from somewhere else and they said see the the budget's balanced everything's fine so we don't find out about this till june so we were you know obviously talking about it publicly a of lot of course so that's where that money and then you know in connecticut we have very strict ethics laws we have very strict freedom of information laws anybody that lives in this state can can go to the freedom of information website and, find out and we can they can file you know a, 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 a freedom yeah. of information request for me or any elected official about certain subjects if you right. want to know everything about any conversation i've had from text messages to emails anything written about I don't know what the casinos. Exactly. Yes, I have to. Do you have to provide it. it for me? Yes. But interestingly enough, this commit this this partnership for Connecticut, they are exempt from all ethics and I FOI laws. I saw that. I couldn't so believe it. I was so. First of all, we were upset that we don't have twenty million, hundred million dollars. Right. Secondly, they've exempted everybody on the board, all thirteen people from freedom of information and ethics laws. So I wrote a letter to the attorney general and asked for an opinion. Because I take an oath at the beginning of January. That's right. Uh, you know, in, in the odd years. Yes. And I swear that I'm going to uphold the laws of the state of Connecticut yeah. and I'm going to do everything I can for my district and the state. Yeah. And part of that is abiding by ethics laws. Yes. So what do I do? Now, by the way, when we appoint people to these boards and commissions as leaders, we have a designee. Because clearly, I'm not an expert in every field. Uh, I can't um, sit on 50 commissions. Absolutely. They wouldn't allow it because they wanted veto power over it over our choices so now we all by statute for the first time in the history of the state of Connecticut are statutorily required to sit on this partnership for Connecticut the four leaders so when I go into that board meeting who am I beholden to yeah my district who I take the oath for yeah, or, or that board yeah so who's I asked your master who's I, your master I, I said that and I got in trouble well too bad <laughs> I, I'll say it again who so, is their master so yeah. The opinion came back saying that we were correct and, and we, we, the four leaders and the governor, are beholden to our ethics laws. Good. But the other people on the board are not. So your you're hands right? are tied. So yeah. that's another problem. Number two, then they wanted to allow, have us decide seven different things, including a $280,000 salary for a, you know, for a president via email. Which then I, you know, I'm always the big mouth in the group. Good, good, Because I'm a loudmouth Greek girl, so I good. don't really keep my mouth shut. I can't help it. <laughs> my favorite kind of people. It's in my jeans. <laughs> and so we made a big thing about that. And so it's just, it's just been a mess. And I just, yep. you know, at and first you have to be, you know, I blame you the governor's be office because they yourself. had to explain, Mr. Dalio, this is a wonderful thing you're offering, but you're in the private sector and we're in the public sector. So and we have different, different roles. Different roles, absolutely. But he didn't. And now this has just become a mess. A big, big mess, you know. The one thing that I really like is that you're not afraid to speak up and say, and that's what I found over and over and over that you you'll stand by your ethical, you know, wherever you think ethically you need to be, that's where you are. And I, and I'm not just blowing smoke at you because you're sitting across from me, but that came over, over and over and over here. You're not afraid to say what you think if it's right. You say it. If it's wrong, you say it. I, I think that's absolutely fantastic, you know. I even forgive you for being slender and blonde, <laughs> but that's my little hang up here. You know? <laughs> well, you know, I always my grand my grandparents came to this country from Greece when they were young and they came over here for the American dream, right? I love and that. And they started a, a, a little market and ice cream parlor and as Families often do. They had a fight, and my grandfather and his brother wanted to split up. Oh, yeah. So they both fought over the ice cream parlor. I don't know why, but my grandfather got stuck with the market, and that's what my dad and my uncles kind of worked in and then grew. And, and I feel like if he were alive now that he would be so, he wouldn't know what this country was about. You no. know, it wouldn't be, it's not the same place. Not the same he and came And so for. I just want to do whatever I can do, you know, my little to part. Keep to, it, to keep it what, yeah, what we the want. The great country The democracy mm -hmm. that we, we're so lucky. Oh, I've, I've already told our audience, you know, I came out of a foster home. And um, it was tough, you know, for both my sister and I. And we put her through college, but I didn't go to college. But, um, and I've said this to some of my friends that are in the, the booth in there, that what other country could a kid who's a state ward, okay, come up through the ranks 
and may end up as a first selectman mm -hmm. in a town in this country. What other country could that happen? Name me one. But I'm going to tell you, I'm so lucky. That's why I'm so jealous and guard so carefully all this democracy that you fight for every single day. I think that's just fantastic. You're not fighting for an old broad like me, but you're fighting for the little guy that's Fighting for tall. everybody, right? If that's what this country is made. It doesn't matter, young, old, in between, educated, not educated, wealthy, not wealthy. I mean, that's what made this country. That's what and made we this country. And we have to make sure that we allow that to continue, but, but in a responsible way. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what you're, that's what you're doing. I'm trying. Well, how do we get a little bit more of a mindset now uh, that we can get people to recognize that we need to be a little more prudent and fiscally responsible. You know, it's, it's hard to say because when I look at what's gone on, at least in Connecticut, in the past 10 years, and you see, you know, people, are, you hear it every day, I'm sure, just like I do. As soon as my husband retires, we're leaving. As soon as my wife retires, we're leaving. As soon as my kids get out of high school, we're, we're leaving. leaving. And it's because the state, it's, I mean, it's the taxes, but it's the burdens on people in the exactly. state. Exactly. And, you know, as I mentioned, my sister is in the house with me, so the first time we have two, two sisters, yeah. and she has a son who just started college. And, you know, we talk about, at times, like what it's going to be like for him. It's for him. You know, in what, 10 years or in 20 years. Yep. I mean, is this state going to be a place anybody can live? I mean, people are leaving left and right. And when you hear, when you hear some of my colleagues on the other side say, oh, nobody's leaving. I mean, it's, yeah. I, you I, have I, to accept what the facts are. Don't, don't, don't yeah, don't blow smoke Don't do this. what yeah. Judge Judy says. I just uh, saw how many, 62% of all the movers that are saying that, that are going out of the state are, from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Sixty-two percent are leaving Connecticut. You know, and when you look at the fact that I think it is the top five percent of income earners in Connecticut pay thirty percent of the taxes, what something right. like that, and then this notion that oh, you just want to protect rich people. No, I want to make the state sustainable. Yep. And what people don't understand is if you have more means, yep. therefore if you have more money, you have more flexibility. That's true. And you have options, so you can live six months in a day in Florida, for example, and pay no income tax, and you're saving money for yourself. Why would you want to pay more money if you didn't have to? I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, I think we're pretty much getting to the end. And here's what I like to end. You know, this has been such fun, but I got to tell you, we got, yeah, we just barely talked about the people that are moving out. We want I wanted to talk about business. I wanted to talk about ice in Connecticut. You got to come back again. I will be happy we, to come we back. Have, you have got to come back again because I got so many, I did all that homework and we didn't get to it. So wow. here's what we're going to do. Um, I probably got, I'd say five minutes, maybe a little less. So. What I'd like to do is ask my guests what you'd like to say. What you'd like to say to your constituents, what you'd like to say to people now that have learned something about you that up until today, they read in the newspaper what you had to say, but today they saw who you are, what you are, you're warm, you're friendly, you've got a great sense of humor. Um, what would you like to say to the people out there in the audience? Well, I would just ask people to really pay a little bit more attention to what's going on in their state. And you may have a, a governor or a state representative or a state senator or a first selectman, uh, what have you, that are nice people. They may come to your, you know, your firehouse spaghetti dinner. They may come to your son's Eagle Scout ceremony. And that's a wonderful thing because those are things we should all do. But we have the ability, and you have the ability, to go online and find out every vote we've ever taken, to be able to call us on the phone, to be able to email us. Find out who represents you. And that. find out if they're doing what they should be doing. Because here's the other problem. We run for state offices, and then there's people who run for federal offices that go to Washington. And those are both just as important, but they have two separate and distinct jobs. So whether the president is Donald Trump or Barack Obama or George Bush or Bill Clinton, you can love them or hate them. Yeah, That's your decision. But that has nothing to do with us. No, nope. absolutely. Okay? That has nothing to do with us. So this notion that we're going to send the president a message and not vote for this or that, well, you know what that gave you this year? 
yeah. that gave you the special transportation fund being rated by $170 million. It raised your taxes over $1.5 billion, and it didn't make the state any better. Oh, I love it. I love you know? it. That's and so right. that's the problem. You have to figure out. I mean, you have to do some of the work, too. You, you have to be We part give of you it. all the tools. You have to figure that out. Don't confuse the two because one has nothing to do with the other. I have right. nothing to do with them, and quite frankly, they don't have a lot to do with us. That's great. I love it. That's a wonderful. It's great. Now i got to try and compete with that. <laughs> but I don't. I'm going to close with exactly the same thing that I close with every time, and that's to say a heartfelt thank you, both from Themis and myself, to all of the veterans for the military, for the first responders, for all those people that are the educators, the people that are so vital to our community, to our state. Um, we thank you. We bless you. And on behalf of both of us, uh, God bless you all, and stay safe. Thank you.